There we go. All right, you can leave your video on if you want. I, don't, I just copied that from something else. Um, this is the ITF note well, um, basically uh, rules, procedures and stuff for um, um, participating in the meeting. Uh, a lot of it has to do with IPR. Um, please, if you know something, say something, basically. Um, some third party IPR disclosures have been made. Uh, um, what else? Also, please be professional, all that good stuff. If you have any questions, you can, you can ask the chairs. And Nick and I are here. I saw Nick around there in the corner. All right, so without further ado, the administrative that we have, let me get, make sure I get it right in the middle. Um, so we did the note well, uh, virtual blue sheets, they might be automatic, I'm not sure. Again, I'd appreciate it if you could go to the Cody. We do need a note taker. I can take some notes. That'd be great, Richard. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I don't know that we actually use Jabber this much in this session, but if there is somebody that's in Jabber, if somebody does say something and would like to get it um, spoken at the microphone or into the, into the audio, feel free to uh, do that for me. I really appreciate it. Um, we got a couple of requests for things to work on. I know that Joel had a um, thing for improving entropy that we want to do at the beginning because he's got a job. Um, at the top of the hour. Um, I know we have kind of outstanding issues that I think we're going to walk through um, the GitHub repo and the protocol, as well as the architecture draft. Um, Karthik uh, has a um, presentation that he'd like to talk about some informed suggestions and comments based on some implementations in F-sharp. And then Mallory asked for about five minutes to talk about the end-to-end -end def definition. Is there any... Um, way you'd like to do this? Do we think, I think we have to keep uh, Joel's first. The question is, should we move the Karthik's presentation up to be in front of the protocol? I would be in favor of that. Yeah, we should Maybe probably do that. Too. All right, I think that makes sense too, because then we can figure out how, that, how it goes from there. So I'll do that. Um, now, if there's any other topics, I think I think there's going to be a lot of topics that deal specifically with the protocol and architecture drafts as we actually work through the GitHub repo. So I think things will just kind of pop up. And the status, woohoo! We got a new draft of the architecture draft, which is great, um, and we're going to continue to iterate on that. Um, the ML protocol document is version 11 still; it's kind of in the free feature freeze, and the federation draft is expired, and we'll hope to get that kicked back off again. Um, maybe after we get the protocol document kind of nailed down a little bit more. The timeline is still the same as last time. We're still kind of in this feature freeze and analysis. Um, I'm hoping that we can get through the stuff that uh, the set of suggestions and changes that we've got now, which may probably result, I think, in another working group last call, but you know, yeah. that's, that's TBD. Sean, if I could add a comment just briefly on a couple of milestones, or not milestones, some progress we've made in implementation. Um, the MLSPP and Open MLS teams have been doing a little bit of interop work, um, have made um, some reasonable progress. I think we, think we are interoperating on pretty much all of the test vectors now, and we, um, we just haven't gotten around to um, doing the actual protocol operations. But that's kind of the next horizon. So we are getting pretty close to um, interoperability on draft 11 plus a couple of nits we found. Um, so that's, that's promising on the implementation front. And then, um, I will just uh, you know, uh, mention here that uh, we are getting pretty close to shipping um, not quite uh, uh, roughly draft 11 in WebEx, uh, I think it's shipping to beta this week. So exciting! Some, some running code out there. All right. Cool. All right. Um, without further ado, let me switch over here to Karthik slides. Stop sharing those slides. Share another set of slides. Are we doing me first or Joel first? Oh, sorry, right. Joel first, oh. right? Yes. Yeah. So I don't have slides for Joel. Um, I don't really either. And yeah. uh, I'd also like to preface this by saying it's Kondrat and and me. Um, so okay. in fact, uh, so, Conrad, please feel free to um, 
jump in at any time and say things help or if you feel like it, you can just leave. Um, otherwise, I would just sort of give the intuition behind what this um, pull request does, um, sort of some pros, some cons around doing it this way, um, kind of addressing the main criticism, I think, that sort of came out on the mailing list. Um, and just putting both both arguments there. So that's that's my plan. So maybe one thing. Is this PR 467? This is 467, yes. All right, let me make sure to share that then. Uh, okay. So, Conrad, would you like to say stuff or should I just go ahead? Uh, sorry, it took me a while to find the button to unmute. Uh, yes, please go ahead. I'll jump in if I have something to say. Okay, good. Well, all right, so, so here's the deal. Um, the idea is that um, we want to introduce with this pull request a couple of ways of hardening the protocol against situations where your operating system or your operating environment, whatever, is giving you bad or no entropy or the adversary is learning about your random your rng state and you know there's different ways of saying the same thing really so what we're trying to do with this pull request is reduce the dependency of the protocol on getting bad good entropy from the operating system right um and so the way we do that is by introducing the concept of an entropy pool that's local to a client um and the way this PR is written is so that it doesn't break compatibility. In other words, you could, in principle, have one client that does this, implements this PR, and another one that doesn't, and they really can just they can just talk to each other. There's no problem. Um, so the benefits are reaped by any client that implements the PR, essentially. Um, so that's in terms of compatibility. At the high level, how does this work? Um, well, so a client that's implementing this PR will have what, what they call an entropy pool, it's it's really just a bit string, okay? It's like whatever, 256 bits, or, or you went, I don't know, I forget what, what we call 32 bytes or something, anyway. Uh, that's what the entropy pool is, okay? And the idea is there's two ways, this, this pool gathers entropy for the client, and there's two sources of entropy that you mix into this pool and then every time the protocol needs entropy because basically because you're generating keys right that's kind of the, the main times when you, there's also these nonce uh, there's sort of this nonce thing that that's the other time i think you need entropy so overall the way that the, the whole thing works is the client will periodically mix in entropy into this pool and it sort of it accumulates inside this pool and whenever the protocol says, oh, shoot, I need entropy because I got a whatever sample a key, then it extracts entropy from the pool. Okay. So that's sort of the overall way that this works. Um, in terms of implementation, it's actually real, it's, it's really quite simple because it's just calling HKDF. That's, I don't think there's anything more to it. You just call HKDF both when you're in, entering, when you're inserting entropy, absorbing it into your pool, and when you're extracting entropy from your pool, they're both just HKDF calls with the right parameters, obviously. Okay, so there's no new crypto primitives or anything uh, uh, being being in, in introduced here. Um, you can now, in you can get entropy from two sources. Um, I think, did we settle in the end on the terminology of internal, external? Well, in any case, you can get entropy either from the outside of, of the whole MLS session and everything, which essentially means it's from your OS or your crypto library or whatever you normally get your entropy from. So that's one place the client can import entropy into the entropy pool. But the other place that's kind of more interesting, maybe at least to me personally, um, was this great idea Conrad had, which is that you can also extract entropy from an existing session, right? So if, if whenever there's a commit, right, we get a new application key schedule. And what this PR introduces is an extra, a new secret that we derive off of this application key schedule, which you can then feed back into your entropy pool. So the idea is this is a mechanism that allows one client who currently is in a state where their OS is not providing them any entropy 
to refresh their entropy pool using entropy that is essentially coming from other clients in a session via the session to this to this client right so this this in, this is kind of important because it's going to play into this discussion around whether we should be really doing this pr in this way or not so i think that's kind of the high level design conrad is there anything i'm missing here from the high level um, no, I think I think you covered it all pretty nicely. Maybe just one thing: the construction is essentially the same as the key schedule. So, um, really, if if there is a bug in the construction, there is a bug in the key schedule, and it's really as simple as it can be. Um, and it's also conceivable to uh, not just include um, entropy from the OS, but also other sources. For example, I think for TLS, there was the proposal made that you could. Uh, get uh, entropy from by like signing a bit string using an HSM and then putting that into the pool. So essentially, the pool is is pretty open as to where the randomness can come from. So it can be extended in that way. Um, and also, like it should be noted that the the randomness that it, that the pool gets from the individual sessions is kind of a, a best effort approach because uh, essentially what it does is it, it it gets a value from the key schedule. And injects it into the pool. So of course, all the group members can get that same entropy. Uh, but it may be depending on your, on your threat model. It's it's if anything, it's a it's a net plus for the entropy at the local client. Oh, sorry, yeah, that was it. Yeah, one thing that also I just uh, I I've, I think uh, to add here is that um, the whole thing is forward secure, right? So uh, both PCS and forward secure in the following sense. If the adversary knows your current entropy pool, but you inject new entropy, even cumulatively, so little bits of entropy at a time, it builds up to a state where the adversary knows nothing about your entropy pool. So now you're getting good randomness. That's kind of PCS analogy here. And the forward secrecy analogy is if you extract a bunch of random randomness, so you're basically generating a bunch of keys, like new signing keys and uh, new seeds for doing update paths and all that stuff. And then after you've done that stuff, the adversary learns your entropy pool. All that stuff you extracted is still secure. So that's like the forward secrecy analogy here. So we get both forward secrecy and PCS on this whole entropy thing uh, in line with what we expect from all our privacy guarantees. So I wanted to kind of summarize my understanding of the pros and cons of doing things this way. Um, uh, let me start with the cons, paraphrasing. Um, so the arguments, I think that sort of the most cogent argument against doing this PR is that we're kind of introducing here, we're Anyone else lose Joel? Yeah, not hearing anything. Okay. I don't know. How oh, I think you're back now. Oh, no, yeah. no. How far did you guys hear? Uh, you were starting the cons. Cons, good. Cons. Um, so the, I think the main con that, that I've, I've, I've seen or I've extracted from the discussion on the mailing list is that providing good entropy should be something that is the role of the environment that we're running our clients in, whether you know the, the operating system or the crypto library or something like that. And so we're kind of mixing boundaries here by saying, oh, well, now also the MLS implementation is also going to be in charge of managing entropy. Um, I think that was one argument against, and another argument against was introducing more complexity. Um, I, I feel like the complexity argument is relatively, for me, relatively straightforward uh, uh, sort of to, 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 to counter because in terms of actual implementation cost, as, as Conrad was saying, I mean, this is, it's really very, very simple. It's a couple of extra calls to HKDF that mirror exactly the way already that our key schedule works. Um, we don't introduce any new primitives. We have one extra variable. Um, so I'm hoping in terms of implementation complexity, that's not too big of a deal here. The caveat being you need to hook, well, no, in fact, you don't. So yeah, so basically I think that's, my point of view is the complexity of the implementation shouldn't be so much of a hurdle. Um, the more, basic argument against is this idea that, you know, we should be not, we should just let the OS deal with randomness. Now, maybe there's an argument to be made there. 
um, I'd, I'd like to sort of have my counterpoints to that argument. I'd like to state those here. Uh, the first being another principle of good design, I think, for security protocols, for crypto protocols, is to minimize our requirements on the environment in which our protocols operate, right? And in this case, one of the key requirements is good entropy. And the exact notion of good is what we're discussing here. And without this PR, we need a very strong notion of good. And with the PR, we need a weaker notion of good entropy. There can be phases where the OS doesn't give you any good entropy or very low entropy or whatever. And with the PR, you remain in secure sessions. And without the PR, you could end up in an insecure session. Right? So this is a one way to view what this PR is doing is to minimize the expectations of the environment that the MLS session operates in, that the client operates in better. Say. That's one thing. The other argument against the separation between the, you know, who deals with entropy, should it be only the OS or not, is this the fact that the PR allows you to pull in entropy from an existing session. This is something that I'm not sure how you would even go about implementing if you want to say, hey, I'm going to outsource all of this to the OS or, or my crypto lib or whatever. I don't see how the OS is even going to do that. And if it is, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be involved and maybe it involves like polling or, or you need your client now to export every time that a commit happened in a session so that the OS no knows, okay, that means I need to pull entropy from the client to mix into the RNG. I don't think that that's really something people are going to do, which means that if we just say we're going to push this to the OS, I feel like we're just not, people are just not going to do this. We're just going to lose that security advantage which the PR gives us. So even if we subscribe to the notion that it should be the OS's job to handle entropy, it's still not clear to me how you go about implementing something that gives us the equivalent security properties that this does. So I think that's sort of my story at this point. I'm not sure if Comrade has anything to add. Uh, I think you've you've pretty much covered it. So Joel, on this yeah. on this particular point, almost always what has happened in the IETF protocols is they point to RFC forty eighty six and they say good randomness is required, and mm -hmm. stop. So that's that's often what 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 gets done. Just just want to let you know. Okay. So if I may, uh, I think this is actually a good idea. My concern is about specifying this in the current documents because it's not really an MLS specific thing. Uh, so the, 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 the part that takes in entropy from uh, MLS, like the fact that MLS actually outputs some entropy to some mechanism is relevant, but in some sense, the mechanism itself actually is not relevant to, to MLS uh, directly. It's more generic than that. So when I, if I were to do this, what I would do is probably separate this from the protocol and say, oh, the protocol, by the way, if you have such a mechanism available, please use it. And specify that in something like uh, a CFRG uh, RFC. Uh, because this is the, you know, it's like, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mechanism that can be useful, actually. I think it's very clever and uh, we should probably add, have that uh, somewhere. But, you know, it doesn't really make sense it, for it to be in MLS, right? So. I think we can do sort of this hybrid thing where we say in the, in the MLS spec, please uh, use that stuff, but actually make the definition outside MLS inside some uh, CFRG specific draft, which can be reused by everybody else, um, if that makes sense. It makes high level sense. I think I would have a little bit of, I would, to at least need help, let's say, in understanding how you would specify in a separate draft how and when to extract entropy from an existing session. Because that's the part that makes it hard for me to put this all on the outside and say that it's independent of MLS. Because but my understanding is not independent. Each of MLS. time you call your NG. Yeah, so I mean, again, that's, uh, that's pretty, I mean, I don't see too much problems there. I mean, if you have such a mechanism, you, you just output some, uh, at some specific point in, uh, in the MLS protocol, you use the, uh, the key schedule to extract some entropy and uh, give it to that, uh, that function. 
and you can do you can actually do it at any time right you don't care because it's uh it's just a contribution so you can do it anytime anywhere uh, like there is no specific reason to to constrain the protocol in, in using this at a specific time or anything um so i yeah maybe nick you have like a, a good opinion since you've already worked on those problems um and as part of the CFRG, I mean, do you think it's interesting to have it as part of a, a specific draft at CFRG that we can reuse for everything else? So I, I would point you to RFC 8937, which is what we did at the R, at the uh, CFRG about this. It, it covers the uh, randomness improvements extracting from either a symmetric shared secret or a um, asymmetric shared secret. Uh, I don't think this covers everything that Joel presented. Um, Joel presented the idea of having kind of an entry pool, which is a little bit beyond this. This this covers just the how do you safely take uh, an existing secret and generate entropy from it. Uh, so uh, it may be possible to refactor this PR down to kind of the bare bones uh, and and reference something like eighty nine thirty seven. But um, eighty nine thirty seven has you know a Proof that CAS and whatnot ha ha have gone through uh, to show that this is a valid mechanism for extracting entropy. So it could be worth referencing this. But um, again, it doesn't cover everything that Joel presented. Okay, so there's uh, Richard is reminding me there's a list here with people being very polite and raising their hands. I don't know who got there first. So let's just work from the top down from what I see. So, Richard, why don't you go first? Then we'll do Karthik and then Raphael. I, I have a bit of a point of order here in that um, the MLS protocol draft is an interop specification. And uh, as I think Joel uh, mentioned at the beginning of his discussion, um, this is something that doesn't affect, it's, it's kind of not externally observable. It doesn't affect interoperability. It's purely about what an implementation does internally to uh, make you know greater or lesser demands on its platform's randomness. Um, so while I think this, so. I think where that points is just that this doesn't, I, I don't see this being a required uh, component of the protocol. I think we can recommend it as something for implementations to do, but I don't think it rises. It's, it's clearly not an interoperability requirement. Um, and so I, I would uh, hesitate to make it mandatory. Um, with regard to the CFRG question, this seems like a small enough thing that it, uh, I might not go to the effort of spinning up a new draft. So I think my, preferred outcome here would be to capture this as a recommendation, um, either in the protocol or uh, architecture documents as an optional recommendation, uh, and just capture it in these these draft these documents here. Okay, Karthik? Uh, yeah, so I think my points have already been mostly covered, but I guess the my feeling uh, when we formalized the spec is that the MLS spec is, has too much implementation detail already. In fact, I would like to remove some implementation specific detail from it and make it more uh, kind of implementation diagnostic, more like a protocol level spec would be ideal actually. So, and this is like Richard was saying, I think it's a very useful thing, but I wonder if there is actually room for a third RFC in, the, in, the, in this working group, which actually is a list of uh, implementation recommendations, because I think we have a bunch of them uh, that are now starting to pollute a little bit the the, the RFC. I mean, uh, one of the concerns, for example, that I brought up uh, a little while ago with the HPKE authors, which I felt had an impact on MLS, is that uh, the way we are doing, uh, the way we are using HPKE in, in MLS, we, in the worst case, might be generating up to N uh, or N minus one keys in a, for every update. Uh, assuming a completely empty tree uh, for doing the HPKE and minus one ephemeral keys. And we have a result locally here. We can prove that, in fact, you don't need to do that. You can reuse the same ephemeral key for all the HPKEs that you're doing in a single update. Now, you can't reuse it across updates, but in a single update, you can, which will significantly reduce both the entropy needs of doing an update and the size of the update, because you can actually share the 32 bytes across all of the HPKE ciphertext. Now, this breaks, in some sense, the abstraction of HPKE. And so it's kind of not a great thing to do at this stage because HPKE is already pretty much a standard. 
However, uh, if you observe it a bit from a bit further away, this can be done by any implementation as long as you have a nice proof that this is actually a, a good way of implementing it, of implementing MHPKE, multiple recipient HPKE. So this could be done in an implementation without breaking interoperability. So in a way, I did not even propose it on the list because I felt, you know what, this is the kind of thing that should go into an implementation recommendation section. You shouldn't pollute the, the spec with something that actually doesn't need to be there, but it would be nice for an implementation to do it for efficiency purposes or in some cases like in this, in this particular PR for security purposes. So there, and, there are, yeah, so Karthik, just to be clear, there's no constraints on making um, an implementation draft. Do we want another draft or to put a section in, the, in either one of these documents? There's no problem with that whatsoever. Okay. And the last kind of point in some sense here is that, yes, there is this RFC at the CFRG, which seems to cover some things. It doesn't seem to allow us to add external entropy in as an entropy pool, which seems unfortunate. I mean, <laughs> it's sort of, if it had been anticipated and so on. But I can totally imagine in a system that we should recommend that people that, okay, MLS is an entropy source. It can actually produce entropy every epoch and we should use it and put it into a pool. But maybe there are TLS connections happening, TLS 1.3 connections happening on the same machine. And maybe the TLS exporters could be a good entropy source too. Why should we restrict ourselves to MLS? You know, in a, in a way, this is a very powerful and useful uh, construction, which I think should mix in entropy from multiple sources and we should allow it to mix in multiple sources to get the best possible entropy in this particular system. Thanks, Raphael. <clears throat> yeah, my plans have been covered as well. Uh, I just want to add one more small thing. Um, Roel, you said that this would potentially allow us to uh, have a, a different definition of, of what kind of uh, quality of entropy we need uh, for MLS. And I don't think that that's entirely true because in practice, when you bootstrap a client, uh, what really happens is that that client needs to generate signature keys first, uh, and then probably a bunch of key packages. Um, and at that point, you don't have any MLS session. So you start with whatever entropy the system gives you. Of course, you can improve it over time, especially for key packages. You can as you do updates, then uh, you can profit from this entropy pool. Uh, for signing keys, that really depends on whether the application rotates signing keys or not. Um, but for the initial phase, it doesn't really lower the requirements you have uh, with mm -hmm. respect to the quality of um, what your operating system gives you. Yeah, I, I also think for the initial phase, it doesn't. It's, uh, it helps in scenarios where you have entropy and then you lose entropy. I think that's more like the scenario where you can still expect security despite having lost entropy and generating keys in this period when you don't have entropy. To be fair, it's a subtle difference between what the good that you need without the PR and the good that you need with PR. I completely agree. It's not a straightforward thing where you can just say, oh, I don't need entropy from the environment. That's not true. There are times where you still need, in particular, the one you pointed out when you initialize. If you can never generate a secret from the get go, then you can't get secrecy in your session, which means also the entropy you import from your sessions will not be random for the adversary. And so you're not actually importing entropy. So you at some point need to be able to establish confidentiality. But after you've established confidentiality, you could lose entropy in your environment. And you can still be, you could still have privacy because you're getting entropy from your sessions and therefore perpetuating the secrecy of those sessions. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. I just uh, want to make sure we're on the same page, but it doesn't solve the initial problem at all. Uh, no, sense. the initial problem, I agree. Okay, so we seem to have drained the queue. <clears throat> so it sounds to me like everybody's on board that thinks that this is important. The question is where to put it. And I um, personally prefer that we actually keep the doc keep this information somewhere in this document until we figure out another landing place for it, as opposed to just kicking it out completely. So is there some way that we can formulate this document, this, this information and put it in an appendix for now and refer to it and say, you know, we gotta have random, we gotta have good entropy. You can go here, but then, you know, RFC 4886 or, um, you know, or this other thing. 
uh, that's in the uh, that's described in our appendix. And then if we do actually get enough people to get their an uh, implementation draft together, that um, it can be moved there. Because I just don't I don't think we should we should lose the information. I, I would be okay with that if we were not trying to finalize this the protocol draft. Um, so I mean it's easy enough to spin up a new draft. I would say let's just start up a new draft, put it in there. Um, and then, I mean, or even just like the, the PR will continue to exist, even if it's closed. Um, and so the text will be there. Um, so I'm, I'm not worried about losing track of this, of this proposal. I really like the idea of an implementation draft to simplify a, the protocol draft and B give implementers implement, implementers a place to find all these, all these sort of considerations. I think that that's a cool idea. All right, if, if that's, if that's, unless there's any objections, I'm, I'm, sounds like a good plan for me. So just to understand correctly, this would be something that's essentially in parallel to the architecture doc and the protocol doc. It would be a new document. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was, I was thinking at one point that the architecture document would actually have some of these kind of implementation hints, but if we're not going to put those in there, we're going to put more specific details in another document. We can just start another document. Start it just starts out as an individual draft, and then we have to do like the process of adopting it, where, where we say, "Hey, does everybody want to adopt it?" And then we we switch it over to a working group draft. But yeah, that's, that's basically the plan. Again, um, if we if we are going to do that, uh, why don't we do that in the CFRG group? I mean. It's super useful if we do it in some sense. To me, it's more like either we we just take it in the protocol document somewhere, or we just uh, we need to do this, right? It's not like we hesitate. So I think okay. Sean is suggesting something more general, um, in particular, not specific to this uh, this randomness improvements draft, but just in a um, protocol implementation considerations draft for MLS in total. Uh, and then some of the protocol draft could be completely extracted as it as um, Karthik pointed out. Yeah, yeah. but you know, I'm, I'm exactly saying that. I mean, it doesn't prevent the other, right? We we can still do that for for things like Karthik mentioned. We can have this implementation thing. But uh, again, I, I don't care in the end if, if it's not used. If people have to point to the ML, to an MLS working group draft, that's fine. Uh, but to me, it makes more sense to have it at CFRG. Uh, even if we have to push it quickly, but you you are, you, I mean, do you think it's valuable or not, uh, Nick? Because if it's, if you tell me like CFRG doesn't care, then we should do that. We should have it in, in the MS working group. If you tell me CFRG is interested in doing that, then we should. I would find, I would find it group. very unlikely that CFRG would be interested in an MLS. I, I agree. Details draft. Okay. Very, so that's the information. Unlikely. So then we can, we can take it as a draft. We have Raphael waiting. No, I think Raphael forgot to put his hand down. Uh, sorry, just struggling with okay. the UI here. Yeah, and just to clarify, the, the proposal that I was making earlier was that I have a feeling that the various implementers of MLS together have already got several things that they would like to document on the right way of doing various things, and we don't want to pollute the protocol document. So I suspect that we, that is going to be quite enough for an implementation draft, uh, including some of the PRs we'll discuss later, I think. Um, yeah. The one thing I would say is that, um, if, if we wanted to um, have a smaller PR on the protocol document, just expressing the requirements um, of, around uh, entropy and saying, you know, this, this protocol uh, does a lot of it, you know, requires a lot of entropy at various points. Um, and produce can produce entropy that could be fed back into uh, something like a pool. Um, I think that that would be a fine thing to have in the security considerations. Okay, it sounds like um, we would want to change. We should change then the PR then, or create a new PR with those security considerations, as you just detailed, Richard, and then create a new document. I don't know how. I don't know how I would go about it, but maybe some. I, I can, can help with that. And. Yeah, thanks. And then and then take that as as the place where we well put this PR uh, as well as probably further uh, PRs. And then if if there's interest in in generalizing this approach and making it available for other protocols as well, um, then we can still see if we want to do that later on. 
Fantastic. All right, I will move on to Karthik's presentation. Let's see if I can make this work. So do I share myself? Uh, I, I should be able to do this. And then you can just tell me when to when to proceed. Can right. anyone see the slides? So, yeah, I can see them. I think uh, people should be able to see them too. All right, so this is um, work that we've been doing at INRIA, uh, and I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on where we are, where we are going and stuff like that. It's a bit rambly, so I'm going to hard stop myself. Uh, it's uh, at the hour, let's say. And if we still have more time, we can go, go over it uh, at the end. Uh, this is just some observations that we came up with and raised some questions, so we want to kind of uh, uh, bring it up at the group. So, Sean, next slide, please. All right, so what have you been doing? You've been very quiet for a while. Uh, so let's remind people that uh, what the, what, in our group, what we have been trying to uh, kind of answer is, can we give a security proof for a comprehensive model of MLS as in something that uh, is uh, a proof that works for all the details of the corner court cases of MLS, including you know, at the byte level. So our approach has been, we've, we've been trying to build and we have now built an executable interoperable model of MLS and FSTAR. So to add to uh, Richard's uh, notes about interop, we now have a third interoping implementation, which also interrupts with open MLS and passes the test vectors. So that's uh, cool. Uh, and the idea was that we were going to define all the security goals using typed invariants in FSTAR, prove not just security, but also functional correctness. So make sure that the parsing and everything is unambiguous and um, uh, the, the 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 state machines can be implemented correctly and so on. And so you have a finally a security proof at the byte level precision of what the spec actually says. And of course, the last step, which you are always interested in is, well, can we link this uh, verified spec, which is executable, so it's really like a reference implementation to an optimized implementation in C. And that's the kind of thing that we that was our, was our approach. Okay, so next slide, uh, uh, Sean. And what we did was, well, uh, we went quite far. So we wrote a, a research report. Uh, it's on that URL up there. And Benjamin uh, finished his PhD thesis this year. Congratulations, Benjamin. And it's, uh, it's in there too. And what it what we did there was we, in, in FSTAR, we wrote formal models of ART, uh, MCAM, GCAM, with blanking, without blanking, with tree signatures, without tree signatures, a whole bunch of these specs in, in FSTAR. And then we added a security model based on malicious insiders so that you could model double join attacks and add or remove even on the, the, the one that we discovered on how when people join. And then we did inductive proofs on the streets to show that the secrecy invariant of MLS holds in all these cases. And so, so at least for the, of course, it fails in certain cases if you allow insider attacks. And then we show that, okay, if you have three signatures of a certain kind, it, it's satisfied. So this was okay but you're not entirely satisfied with this because in order to actually formalize the notion of our secrecy and uh, post-compromise secrecy, uh, in fact, the existing models in FSTAR were not adequate because they didn't actually uh, allow us to speak very precisely about the trace and the sequence of events that were happening. So we ended up inspired by this development, actually doing a completely new symbolic verification framework in FSTAR that can actually cleanly handle things like forward secrecy and PCS and so on. And that became its own beast. It's a completely different project and completely new uh, verification style, very different from anything you've seen before in FSTAR or not seen before. Um, and so we had to take a pause on this. So next slide, Sean. So what we ended up doing was building a full verification framework called DY star for doing symbolic proofs in FSTAR. This is published at uh, Euro SNP this year. And the link is over there, you can go stare at it. And what this is, is a new framework for symbolically verifying cryptographic protocols and their implementations in FSTAR. Its design was heavily influenced by MLS, but it's more applic applicable more generally, of course. And it has its uh, novel trace-based semantics, which is built in. So it's a completely new uh, way of proving things in FSTAR. And the nice thing is, of course, since we're doing type checking, the proofs are all modular. So however large the code gets, the proofs tend to be quite very, very much scalable and they're all machine checked, right? And the soundness of this verification method itself was proved in a start. This took us a long time to kind of do this. So we put MLS on the side and we kind of developed the verification method. And then we have tried, showed that it's generally applicable by applying it to signal, noise, ACME, and so on. And then we came back to MLS, okay? So next slide, uh, Sean. So this is what we've been doing for the last few months. So Teofil Valles, who will speak in a little while, was a new PhD student to join the group and took the baton from uh, from Benjamin. And he uh, 
So what he's been doing is, uh, and all three of us have been doing is to build an interoperable model of draft 11 and F-star. It's, it's more or less complete. Let's say it misses some features, but it uh, passes all the test vectors from OpenMLS. Open and it's it's modular in the sense that it's broken down into several sub protocols. And this is something you'll want to speak about in a minute. <laughs> And all the underlying cryptography uses uh, specs from Hacklestar, and eventually will use actual verified code from Hacklestar. So it's all built on a on sound foundations. And just to give you an idea, right now this spec is about two thousand lines of Hacklestar. We think we might be able to keep it at that size um, even as we go forward and finish all the corners. Okay, it'll be about two thousand lines of Hacklestar. Of course, this is just a spec. We, but it's executable, it's testable, but it's a spec. So the next step is obviously to encode the security goals and prove them. So we hope to take all the work that we did before um, on ART and ML and GCAM and so on and adapt it in, for this new model and do this proof. So that's going to be our task for the next few months. And we hope to have something concrete released and both the implementation and, uh, and the proof in uh, in a few months. Okay, so that's, that's where we are right now. So, um, uh, for the, the purpose of this talk is to I'll tell you where we are and to also give some feedback based on what we found during this formalization step. So there's four things we'd like to mention and time willing, whatever, we, we can either mention them today or we can discuss them some other time. Uh, and I'm gonna start by this idea of decomposing MLS into sub protocols, which is what we did in our spec. Uh, but then there is this uh, note we sent on the mailing list about optimizing unmerged leaves and simplifying the key package. And there is a there's a fourth point about well why do we need free math anyway kind of thing okay so uh, uh, let's go ahead with decomposing MLS uh, next slide so when we were trying to uh, write down a formal spec of MLS we, we we're kind of getting scared now because it's getting to be a pretty large protocol uh, I think it's not so easy to say I'm going to take a fragment of this protocol and prove it anymore because the dependencies are all over the place. And in a way, it doesn't have to be that way, okay? So, but the way it has evolved is that we have added things and features. And so now there is a little bit of a monolithic thing going on uh, in the current spec, which I'm hoping the next rewrite, we can at least, without changing anything technical, we can at least like separate out the components a little bit better without affecting the, the technical details of the protocol. So the way MLS has evolved is that, well, it's doing dynamic group membership, uh, but it's also doing a group key distribution, is doing application data encryption. And then there are exceptional features for preventing insider attacks and some optimizations like unmerged leaves. And all of these are like mixed together in the ratchet tree. And this makes it pretty hard to specify and to prove. So here's uh, next slide, Sean. So here's a decomposition that we are using in our spec and we wonder if this is not more useful generally. So I think MLS naturally breaks down into three sub protocols, which I'm calling tree sync, tree chem, and tree dem. Tree sync is basically the protocol, the sub protocol that manages the group membership and synchronizes the group across various parties. And the spec actually talks about tree synchronization separately. But if you think about it, this tree synchronization protocol does not need to care at all about what is the content that is stored in each node and each leaf. The fact that they are public keys or cipher text or whatever is actually not important. All we're trying to do is replicate this data structure across all group members and keep them synchronized. So we need tree agreement and authenticity. It's a tree-shaped data structure that we are synchronizing, that's for sure. And we need signatures, tree signatures actually, to make sure that everybody is synchronized. And we need some kind of hashing for the parent hashing and so on. But really the encryption, the secrecy of, uh, of tree keys and so on does not really matter for this protocol. And a big chunk of the MLS draft is actually doing tree sync. The way it's written, it's interspersed with all the secrecy and the, and the, and the ciphertext and encryption, but really it can be separated out. In our spec, we have separated out this part completely from, uh, from tree chem. The second part, which I'm calling tree chem, is actually the protocol that uses trees to distribute keys. And here you can assume that there is actually a tree which has been correctly uh, uh, synchronized across all nodes. And all, all we're doing is using the key structure to create updates for uh, the node secrets and to encrypt the node secrets to different people, okay? And so this is the protocol that ensures FS and PCS for the node secrets, epoch secrets, init secrets, and so on. And this needs to use HPKE and KDF, but it, this doesn't really need to use any signatures or EAD or any of that stuff, right? 
And the third part, which we call message framing, I guess, in the in the spec or application data protection, is tree dam. Is what you're calling tree dam. It's nothing surprising. Once you have the epoch secret, then you can derive keys for encrypting each message. And so this is taking care of the application data uh, encryption protocol. So all three of these are tree-based protocols. They all share the common tree data structure, but they are really trying to do very different things. And it's by collapsing them all into one ratchet tree or in, in one conceptual space, I think they are kind of confusing things and making proofs and harder and the properties harder to understand. So, uh, so this is how we've structured our, our spec. We are separating out these three components and there are benefits to this. So suppose you take the tree cam protocol or whatever the MLS protocol and you separate out this tree sync component. What are the benefits? Well, tree sync doesn't care about encryption at all. It doesn't care about anything. Nothing is secret in tree sync. Everything is public data structure. Okay, well, we could and we could think of it as not being public in the sense of privacy, but really for, for the security guarantees of MLS, it's, it's all public data structures. There's no key derivation. There's no secrecy. There's no encryption. You can express the create, add, remove op operations directly in tree sync. For update, you can still express update, but the contents of the update are opaque byte strings. They're not... Uh, they're not ciphertext, they're not uh, public keys, they're just opaque byte string. From the viewpoint of tree sync, you're just updating a path in the tree. You can even express the notion of unmerged leaves, parent hashes, all of this doesn't require any consideration of, uh, of key derivation, okay, of how the keys work. Instead, what you do is you focus on this in protecting the integrity and authenticity of this tree data structure against both outsiders and insiders. You can actually state what the double join attack means directly on the tree sync protocol without even thinking about uh, HPKE encryption, secret secrets. No, you don't even have to think about it. The double giant protocol can directly be expressed on the tree sync protocol. And if you think very uh, at a high level, what is nice is that in the MLS spec, we already have a good understanding of what tree is supposed to achieve, which is a secrecy invariant that we state in the spec. But in fact, tree sync has an equally nice property, which is an authentication invariant that it enforces. So what is the in, uh, authentication invariant of tree sync? Which is, it is that the content that you have at any non-blank node M must have been written by one of the members under this node M. So it's a write policy that we have here, not a read policy. So we say that this content, we don't care what the content is, it's opaque, but this content should have been authored in some update by uh, one of the leaves underneath this node, okay? And so, which means that basically every update is signed, you must have checked the signature and you have to rely on tree signing for the joiners in order to get this kind of guarantee. And you obviously have the property that since you have checked the signatures, if the, the member who signed this particular node was honest at the time at which it signed this node or at the time you verified the signature, then you get the guarantee that the subtree at that node, at that member is the same as the subtree in your local tree. So do you have this order? nice integrity authentication property that you can have uh, uh, based on just the tree sync uh, protocol. Okay, uh, next slide, Sean. Conversely, there is also benefits to tree, tree cam. Once you remove the tree sync part of it, it actually becomes very simple. Okay, all, your, all tree cam is doing is sort of like the original art paper already had this idea, but the original art paper was only doing key distribution, didn't worry about signatures and so on. And this, this is what you get out of TreeCam. You, you basically get to do just updates and tree de a key, a key derivation for each node. And, and that's it. And you, of course, manage the transcripts and so on, maybe. But, uh, but you can actually remove a lot of the tree management stuff out. Okay. You don't care about signatures, authentication. Parent hash is not part of TreeCam. You don't have to worry about any of that. Instead, you just focus on key derivation. And you think about it. You, what TreeCam is doing is enforcing the read access control policy, which is already documented in the MLS spec which is a tree secrecy invariant, that the node secret and any non-blank node can only be read by one of the members underneath it. Okay, so uh, so that's sort of, a, it's, there's benefits to both sides by, by kind of factoring these out, at least in the specification. Next slide, uh, Sean. All right, so what did we do? We kind of divided up the protocol into these three parts and you find that they get kind of quite equally separate out. So tree sync and F star is about 400 lines. Tree cam is about 350 lines. Tree dem will be about 200 to 250 lines. We haven't completed the tree dem part, but we did most of it. And we expect that these can also be because we have separated out the crypto components. You separate out the security goals. We expect that the security proofs will also be quite modular, but this is something that we are working on now. I cannot 
promise it, but that's uh, that's the idea. Um, my question, I guess, for this part of the of the of the development is that we can either take this what I've said so far in two ways. One, maybe this is a good way for implementations to structure themselves, and something like a recommendation of decomposing the protocol into these sub protocols should be part of something like an implementation document. Alternatively, maybe this also points a way as to maybe we should rewrite a little bit or restructure or the, the MLS protocol RFC in a way that makes this separation a little bit more explicit would be made perhaps uh, a nice thing to do. And I don't know. I don't know what, uh, what uh, without change, because none of what I have said right now is actually changing the spec. It's more, mostly about how to separate out the different components of it. There is, of course, an issue, which is that not the separation is always not not always super clean. I, I pretended that it was, but in fact, there's at least one or two places where separating out tracing and tree cam was a bit of a pain. And one of them is the parent hash construction, because the parent hash construction currently depends on the tree resolution of the sibling. So it actually tree resolution for us belongs in tree cam, and parent hash belongs in tree sync. So this separation was a uh, cause some uh, is causing some ugliness in our specs. But if we accept that this is actually a worthwhile separation to have, then it's not so hard to, to remove this kind of a dependency for very specific uh, components. For parent hash, instead of using the tree resolution of the sibling, I think we could use a tree hash on the sibling, for example, and that would kind of uh, break this uh, uh, dependency. Uh, but that's only worth it if we decide that even in the protocol, maintaining the separation is a worthwhile idea. So I'm going to stop now and take some questions. We have a few more things to discuss, but we could do them later, uh, depending on what you. All right, Joel has his hand up first. I, I just have a it's a really short question. It was a couple slides back where you were talking about tree sync. Um, you, you you had this comment that uh, double joins can be demonstrated on tree sync. Yeah, what does that mean? Because to me, double join is also is mainly a privacy thing, and my understanding is tree sync doesn't deal with privacy. How how do I interpret that sentence? Exactly. So I think you interpret it as double join. What it's doing is actually violating the tree authentication invariant. Okay, and as a corollary of that, then it violates the privacy of um, of uh, uh, of the of the of the keys uh, at that node, but that's that's a separate point. The first thing it violates is actually the authentication invariant because it says that somebody who's not at a particular node is able to so at a particular leaf is able to get control over the over the contents that you are writing on that leaf and on its parents. So okay. yeah, that's what I mean by that. So it's okay. demonstrable as a so let's see. Let me put it this way: Double join already violates the properties you would state for tree sync. I'm not saying that the attack which results from double join is demonstrable in tree sync. Mm. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. The, the other comment I had is, uh, well, we I, I I'd super love to see this in in more detail. This tree, this this how you how you guys define these three modules. We've been Matt and I've been working on on. Uh, some modularization ourselves, and I'm hopeful that at the very high level that I've understood from the slides, I think it it should work in the proofs too. We're we're because we're also ending up in not completely different way of modularizing things, and we're actually doing it in, for the purpose of proofs. So of it course. sounds to me like this is the very natural breakdown. I think, and yeah. Yes, Joel. So we have been highly inspired by the series of papers you've written as well. And we've been looking at the proofs, for example, for the insider attacks paper and saying, well, could you have done this kind of proof without worrying about, you know, some aspect of the protocol? Could you remove this part, aspect of the protocol and still do the proof? And that's the kind of thing, I mean, looking at your work is what is also inspiring that maybe some modularization would help in, in doing the full big beast in the end, you know? Yeah, I'm happy someone's reading it. All right, that's it for hands. Is I think uh, Benjamin, let's hand it for a second, then you put it down. Richard? Nope. All right, someone threw something down in the chat. Right, right. I guess so, I have, sorry, just, just one, because you, you said at the end about you proposed this idea of um, even rewriting the spec 
in a more modular form. If we were to start from scratch, I would say absolutely that's the way to go because of how complicated things are. At this point, I'm not half as sure. Just yeah, because I, I feel like that would be quite a big freaking job. That would be a big freaking change. Um, so um, uh, I agree. I mean, it's um, it's uh, the spec is has evolved in the way it has evolved, and uh, there's a lot of text and 80 pages of text in there. So uh, and multiple implementations already. So uh, at this stage, I guess the the best uh, one could hope for is to have the conceptual uh, components described in the introductory text and maybe use uh, some kind of terminology to cleanly separate out the, the section headings, basically. That's basically at most I think you can do. And if there are some subsections that should become full sections or whatever, this kind of change is not really uh, a full rewrite is inconceivable, I think. Um, uh, that, that seems right. Like laying out this as a conceptual map for people to understand the more detailed stuff that's in there right now uh, seems like a fine thing to do either kind of in the top part of the protocol spec or in the architecture spec. Um, because if you think about it, we already do this with the ratchet tree description uh, where we don't really say exactly how it is to be, how it is specified. We actually say this is the conceptual ratchet tree. What I'm showing here is actually saying that the ratchet tree is actually three trees and they are for different purposes. And you know what we are explaining in the in the spec right now is the mix of tree sync and tree cam, and maybe we could just separate it out a little bit in that introductory part without changing any of the mandatory parts later. Let's say. I think it would be up to. I think uh, I think he left um, uh, Richard, but I, I I think I'm. I would be game to take a crack at it, uh, like do a minimal uh, change thing. Uh, which would be basically just a rewrite um, of those sections in a light way, but just to speed it. Uh, I don't mind. I don't mind doing that work actually. So maybe if 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 that I mean if that, that works for everyone, I can submit a PR in the next few weeks um, to try to do this. Um, Rafael, what do you think? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, from a practical point of view, we still have a bunch of open questions on the yeah. current spec. So, um, I mean, it's great if you want to start a rewrite, but we will be struggling with addressing the open questions because I think we will not address all of them today. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, if, if your rewrite is successful in the sense that uh, we all agree that we shouldn't switch to that, um, yeah, that, that's one more step to consider. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll, we can rediscuss when to do that, though, whether we want to do it after or before we handle the other stuff. But uh, right. if, if we are gonna if we are gonna attempt to do do something like this, I, I will take that uh, that PR. Okay. So, Sean, I promise to stop at the top of the hour, and I think there's a bunch of PR issues to go through. Yes. So maybe we split now, we can, we go on to the other two topics. And if there is some time left at the end, uh, Teofil could address, uh, could discuss some of the other suggestions that came out of our analysis. I think that'll work. And thank you for being relatively on time and you're taking questions. All right, so let me stop sharing this. And so then the question is, um, uh, pro protocol or architecture document? I feel like we should probably do protocol first. Can you lead that discussion, Raphael? Um, sure. On the other hand, I think Richard is going to join again. Um, he, he is going to join again later. So maybe we could do architecture. So yeah, in that sense, architecture would be a more appropriate one. I guess. All right. Sure. Um, so I mean, there are not too much we can, if you can share screen, uh, Sean, yeah. about the, the, the issues. There are not too many uh, issues left. So we did a bunch of big rewrites for the last uh, architectural draft where uh, we handled a lot of the comments that were already there. So there are only a few uh, remaining topics that we want to, to, to handle for that, for that uh, document. 
plus the few there are very few open issues in the documents uh, but there is there is still a, a lot of contributions that uh, that people want to make so um the the main i think uh thing that we have to improve on the document is the expected type of deployments so the thing that was su uh, suggested by brandon um it basically it basically like the idea is just to uh give a few of the possible kind of deployments and describe them a bit uh a bit more thoroughly in the in the draft uh so it uh, because you know you have so many kind of uh, different deployments uh, making the language as agnostic for the deployment is quite difficult um so uh, conrad britain has actually made some suggestions on and contributions on prs where uh they suggested some changes to make sure that we say for instance that the uh, authentication service uh provides certain properties such as uh, credential authentication, message authentication, and actually like uh, give a bit more detail. And the 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 rest of the draft is like there is a huge fraction that was not be there before about uh, security considerations, where the idea is to go from the smallest compromise to the biggest compromise. So in some sense, like what happens if you compromise an HPK key? What are the guarantees that the protocol should aim at? Uh, if you break, you know, uh, uh, the secrecy of the signature private key when you get, uh, etc. And like grow and grow and grow uh, with stronger and stronger attackers up to the point where you get a full uh, full state compromise for for uh, for one of your clients. And what are the consequences and things like this? Um, so there are really those two parts, like the functional requirement parts and the security analysis part. Um, Kaz, uh, Brita, uh, and Conrad are actually uh, chilling a few pull requests on this to to kickstart the the things that they they actually think is not as good as they as it should be. But globally, most I I believe that most of the content is already there. And then there is this PR for the functional side, uh, this PR from uh, this uh, issue from. Uh, from Brandon um, to describe more like the, the general architecture uh, designs that uh, that can uh, that can happen. Um, so this one I uh, will probably need help. Uh, I asked. Uh, I, I will ask. I will rediscuss this with Brandon. I, I thought he would join, but um, I will rediscuss this with uh, with uh, with Brandon. But any help here in terms of what we want from the document? Generally, I mean. For the entire document, what we really want is to have contributions, issues opened on what you think is missing from the document. Uh, so we handle like most of them have been already handled. Uh, many of them have, have been handled, but uh, you know we have a lot more th things to actually say in that document uh, that we, we can like we have infinite topics in some sense. So if you think that there is something missing or that, that there is something incorrect that's the value uh for the architecture document right now so just like reading the document and uh, opening an issue of this is wrong i don't think that's correct or uh, i think we should discuss this um because everything that we had listed before is sort of handled now except for a few open issues in the document uh so it's going pretty well. Uh, I don't see the document particularly late uh, or lacking behind the protocol document. Um, but I think now I think the the best thing is just to have more readers and like open issues. That's the that's the valuable thing to do here. Um, so yeah. Yeah, because this document is going to be very important to help get the proto -doc protocol document through the ISG. So I don't know how everybody else sees this, but I see these two documents going at the same time. Yeah, they should um, be. At the, they should go at the same time. Um, so so really, great. I mean, the, the real need is for people to actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> if you see what I mean, um, yeah. and open issues. Uh, that's why. Uh, Are there any of these particular issues that you think we need to go through now? No, not specifically. And most of the issues are usually editorial. Yes. So, so there is one which might uh, be interesting that we never discussed. Actually, uh, we discussed it at the very beginning of the of the 
of the working group is whether we should actually provide uh, recommendations for uh, key updates in terms of amount of time. I'm pretty much against it because um, it's very difficult depending on the use case and the infrastructure and the device on which you run the protocol to to ask or to require any kind of specific uh, time frame for commit for making commits. So I would pretty much say, so the way we tackle this for now in the document is that we say that if you don't update frequently, if a compromise happens, here is what's happening. But we don't, uh, we don't say, you know, you should update every 12 hours. Uh, and I don't think we should really do it. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for inputs here. What are our opinions on? I don't think we can actually because of the different use cases that we have. We have so many different use cases that I'm not sure it makes sense, but. Um... So this is separate from like the kind of key update things that quick and TLS have provided, right? This is, this is about. Um, it's so this about, is basically about design. commits. Yeah. It's, it's not it's about. Like, it's basically about commits. My take is I would be hesitant to make any recommendations about commits and updates because there's just so much flexibility and so many different ways you can do that and so many different constraints and everything. I can hardly imagine anything more useful to say than do it as much as you can afford to for the devices that are at greatest risk or something like that. Very vague. But that yeah, would be makes my sense take. to me. Um, yeah, I agree I mean, with that as well. Okay, so if if most people agree of this, if there is nothing, I mean, we should probably close that thing. And uh, I will phrase it exactly as we discussed. Uh, like we should make it as 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 uh, often as possible. But I don't think there is any specific things that we can recommend otherwise. So yeah, I think the best we can do is have the um, the reader enable the reader to make an informed choice and give a vague recommendation and a form choice that just means that we should be specific about the security that we get from doing an update and yeah the reader and that, that would be uh, that would already be in the in the documents especially in the compromise scenarios all right going once okay. going twice sold so i guess you can close it but yeah, really, what we need now is is uh, more readers, more readers, and opening issues to make sure. So my, basically, the concern that we have is to make sure that when we go to last call or something like this, we don't miss too much uh, things that we want to discuss, things that we uh, that we think might be important to discuss. Uh, if we achieve that goal, I mean, I'm pretty happy with the. I will be pretty happy. At, uh, the document after like a few editorial paths and things like this. So it's um, in terms of content, I think we already hit a lot of uh, different uh, things that we're interested to discuss. Okay, I closed the I closed it and um, put a comment in. Okie dokie. So now we can uh, let's jump over to the end to end um, discussion. Is Mallory here? Hey, yep, I'm here. Um, I prepared like a, a few short slides, but I don't have to use them. I don't know if I'm able to share my screen, but you, you can if you want. If you um, if you you can just I think you can just grab share and go with it. And then hey. if I, I'd appreciate if you could just send me them afterwards. I would love I to do that. Them. All right, cool. It was an afterthought, so that's no worries. Okay, um, that should be working now. Does it work now? Cool. Yep, we're seeing them. Great. Yeah, thanks for your time today. Um, there's a draft in the data tracker. Um, it's right now on its own, no working group, um, but I did send it to you all on the list maybe a couple weeks ago. The title is Definition of End-to-End -end Encryption. Um, some of you have seen this, um, and initially before it was in the data tracker, I asked around about, you know, where's the best place in the IETF for this? Um, and I think the reason why I sent the O1 and so the, o, the 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 original version was just that it appears there may it may actually be applicable because um, we're not just talking about messaging apps. There's lots of applications for what protocol you are all designing. So I think it it actually fits. So let me get into it. Um, I'm co-authoring with uh, Fred Baker, Olaf Kolkman, uh, Sophia, who's a contributor to this working group, and Gershabad Grover. 
Um, the goal of it is quite simple. We just want to define it. Um, there's no real, there's some really good drafts out there that use end-to-end -end encryption and therefore have um, done an elegant job of describing what is it in their context, but there's nothing that's really overall. We feel like there's, that's like a nice big gap in the IETF. Um, so the outcomes we're hoping for with this draft, um, we're seeing definition creep in mostly like public relations and like political debates, things being called end-to-end -end encryption that are not um, just straight up. Uh, it's not great. <laughs> uh, so we also want this to be um, a helpful place to put um, things that maybe don't as easily fit in the architecture of the protocol draft um, as, that, as a way of sort of offloading sort of long-winded conceptual definitions of things. Um, and then the last thing we want is that we want to drive the definition with principles and norms, um, but then also that should influence the way implementations work so that you have different ways of articulating the things. These are things we don't want to do. <laughs> Another reason why we hesitated to get this draft into MLS, um, we don't want to define it by what it isn't, like saying, for example, like um, an end -end encrypted app that traces all of its messages is not end to end encrypted. We want we we wanted to avoid all of the things that we feel like are sort of um, deviations from um, solid E two E. The second thing we wanted to avoid is um, by directly invoking threat models. Um, we did that on purpose. Um, although I think we in speaking with others like Stephen Farrell and so on, like it's going to be useful to use threat modeling to potentially figure out holes and gaps in the way that we define it, but we don't want to rely. Again, it's like we don't want it to be an anti-definition. And then the last thing is um, we wanted to be careful about the debate and engineering discussions that happen in the open and the IETF around this draft, because going back to one of the main goals, um, if there's a whole lot of dissent or disagreement about fundamental requirements, then that could actually be um, harmful to um, a crisp and clear definition of what is E2E and what is not. Right. So the draft itself, um, it's really breaking into three pieces uh, because we felt like one approach to defining it wasn't quite good enough. So the three different approaches to defining it are meant to complement one another. So the first is just like a straight up formal definition, like can we just define the building blocks, the relevant pieces of it? Um, the second is um, definition by features. So trying to functionally define it. Um, and then the last one we felt was important to include around, you know, when a user is um, told that a system is end-to-end -end encrypted, what do they expect? Um, so hopefully those three perspectives kind of give one, you know, a full picture of uh, what E2E is without being too long-winded. Um, so very quickly, the only major change from um, the initial draft to the O1 is that we added a subsection around endpoint because there seemed to be, we had in the end to end principle section, but there seem there is and it's actually really critical to figure out where's the end um, in a device. Is it the application? Is it the operating system? Is it the person operating it? You know how do we do that? So we um, created a section for that. What we're going to do next, um, so thanks very much to Raphael for um, an initial review and to others who've also given reviews, but like on the back end, not on the MLS list, we're going to incorporate what comes through um, either on the list or in GitHub in the next version, um, probably within the next couple of weeks, actually. Um, one of the things that is seeming like a lot of the feedback involves us getting just a little bit more thorough in the sort of short definitions that we have of features, right? So like perfect forward secrecy and um, uh, anonymity and all those things that are not directly related, but certainly are part of an engine encrypted system. Folks just think we need to be more clear. Um, but I would like to be as precise and short as possible. I'm going for like really sort of quotable bytes and also readability, right? Because we imagine that this draft, because it's a definition, would be um, an accessible document outside of the um, engineering community as much as it is useful to this working group. And then the last thing is um, we were hoping that, like I said before, in one of the goals, like we're, there's no timeline on getting this um, finalized. Like it would be something that could sort of accompany 
uh, the MLS working group as it does its other work, um, such that we can strategically place things in it, take things out, put them elsewhere, like sort of use it as um, sort of a scratch pad for a while for things. Um, so to that end, wondering if, and we can discuss after my next slide, if there'd be appetite for a working group adoption now or at a future point, something that we want to want to think about. And then, yeah, that's, this is just the link directly to it in GitHub if you want to um, check it out, um, do reviews, pull requests. Um, and it's obviously in the data tracker as well. On the first slide, I had that link. So anyway, I'll there. Yeah, it sounds like there are questions. Let me know. I'm sorry, I didn't put slide numbers. I always forget. Karthik, you're up first. Uh, hi, that's, that's a very interesting idea to do a definition uh, like this. I'm wondering if, uh, I mean, is it a black and white thing or are there levels of E2E, right? So, um, E2E. Uh, for example, if a server were to, like in the MLS scenario, were to manage the groups, as in knows the membership of the groups and uh, and so on, this is what is one of the possible deployment scenarios for MLS, right? It's actually the server does know a lot of metadata about what's in the group. Would that still be considered E2EE according to your draft? We shouldn't get into a situation where MLS fails the definitions. So. I totally agree. That's exactly why I think we want to write this down so that it's there is clarity around that pre precise question. So I don't, I'm not going to say I know the answer, but I think from the from the document it sort of takes a principled approach and then a feature approach. And I think where you're talking about is maybe the feature approach. And obviously, you know, we're defining anonymity within there, not because we think that every system is gonna have perfect anonymity for people. That's just probably too hard and too absurd. But the point of that, like, these are the hard problems that end-to-end -end encrypted systems are trying to solve for the sake of security and privacy. And then the sort of way implementers trade off those things because some of them are actually paradoxical. Um, the way that implementers uh, like try to address these hard problems and trade off various features to achieve um, a system um, that happens elsewhere. That happens in other drafts. But here you've got sort of it's almost like a menu of of different options, and I think it's going to help a lot in answering exactly that question. Like, are we comfortable calling? Um, you know, a system that maybe has more metadata than others, like still, and what's the line, right? Joel. Hey, um, I was just wondering, do you envision PGP and, and systems like that to be included or um, do you, like under this definition, essentially, or do we need, because you did mention forward secrecy, mm -hmm. uh, do, would you like the definition to draw the line at sort of updating security like PCSFS, or could it also include PGP? Yeah, so that's, that's why I think we hesitated to put this in MLS in the first place, because we realized there are other places where this is being discussed, LAMPS and, and Open PGP is now uh, a working group. Um, so I think at some point we have to make a decision, although one of our, I think a, a, a major part of this plan is to get, to like notify the SAG or, you know, group as well, like to ask for reviews. Um, Cause I'm not, it, well, one is to ask for reviews, but then two, to ask this larger question of like, where does this belong? Cause ideally it's, it's highly applicable to everything that's using end-to-end -end encryption, but at the same time, like, yeah, I, I, I don't really know. Like, I felt more confident that MLS is doing more than initially, you know, had had um, set out to do by going beyond just, you know, messaging systems, but maybe um, it gets us a little bit closer to having the answer, but um, there, there are other ways of doing this. I mean, yeah, somebody suggested like putting it in Model T. I thought that was a interesting idea, but maybe not a great one because um, I think... Um, yeah, model, it would be like the anti-definition problem, right? Anyway, I don't have an answer, Joel, sorry. Uh, that's okay. So let me just, uh, I just, before I pass on the, the token or whatever we're calling it, uh, I just wanted to, why did I ask that question? Because to me, um, 
PGP is end-to-end, -end, but it's from an older generation of end-to-end -end cryptography. And since then, we've moved on, you know, double ratchet, MLS, all these things. But the distinction to me is really a, a matter of the security they go for, rather than the notion of what is an endpoint and what is encrypting to the endpoints. And so I don't see a natural way to distinguish between these generations of these technology without getting into security definitions, which I feel is almost a quagmire. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard to clearly define this in a way that we can talk with non-technical people about these notions and get the sound bites. So that's why I was sort of asking yeah. what the scope is, because I think it's easier to just do end-to-end -end that includes PGP and everything, maybe right. less useful though. But it seems to me like a more tractable problem to define that. Okay. That's why I was just asking. No, I think it's I think it's an interesting one. I don't really see like from a user perspective. I'm not sure we have to get too precious about the difference between the generations. I mean, surely, um, it, it uh, so yeah. I just like to to tease that out a bit. Like, what would be the goal of trying to make a distinction um, when potentially they're just seen as, yeah, like you said, generations, and that maybe it's a good thing that a definition could encompass both considering there may be, you know, another generation in the future that would, we would want this definition definition to actually either guide us towards or at, at minimum encompass um, so that it's somewhat immutable as much as technology can be. Yeah. Anyway, I, thanks for bringing I, it up. I think I'm done. I don't want to. I don't want to waste time here. Conrad, you're next. Um, yeah, I also think this is a really interesting project, and I have to admit I haven't read the, the draft yet, um, although I certainly plan to now. Uh, so I was just wondering because uh, end -to -end, part of end-to-end -end encryption, kind of at least in my mind, has to be end-to-end -to -end authentication as well. So, and since MLS doesn't really specify authentication. Um, how do you do you think MLS would even like has a chance to to qualify without making any assumptions um, with regard to authentication? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. Um, I think that that's obviously something that would need to be in this definition, um, and I think is, but um, wouldn't necessarily be part of what MLS does. I don't think that that means you're completely avoiding invoking it, right? So I imagine in the architecture draft, there's going to you're going to be signposting to implementers like how the protocol fits in with a larger system. So you may be using, um, you know, keywords that we would want to define in this draft. Um, and actually, it's a really good use of this draft so that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time talking about um, technology that's not part of um, the MLS protocol. You can put it in the definition draft, and then you just sort of uh, point to it. I don't know. That's actually a very good point. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. So um, I think that we have to figure out what we would do with this going forward. I think in the short term, I think that this probably needs to go to SEC dispatch. I know I'm like giving you another working group to go to because I do see that it's more broadly applicable. Um, and that's the group that that kind of says wh which working group to go to and whether an AD should sponsor it. So it kind of shows you the paths for mm -hmm. where you could go. Um, yeah. I want to uh, draw your attention to RFC 4949, which is loved and hated, but it's 365 pages of definitions of security terms, including end-to-end -end encryption, endpoints and systems like a whole bunch of stuff um it's it's pretty um it's encyclopedic and it, but it's much it's much like a uh it's more like a dictionary and so there's less prose <laughs> whether that's helpful or hurtful i don't know um but it's something i think we should you you might want to at least look at that um because i believe that document went through and was ad sponsored so as opposed to going through a working group right that was some, yeah that's definitely come up as an option um i like we must cite 4949 if not that's a big oversight um but yeah. i know people have i know i've read it and well, well, well like i said people love it and hate it so you know right. <laughs> pick, pick cherry pick I the parts you like value. and i think that you know this wouldn't at all replace what's in 4949 with respect to end, -end encryption it's just yeah. this is a way more verbose yeah. approach to it that i think provides space for nuance and for different uh, you know 
like I said, the, the ways in which we define things formally can be very useful, but they are limited. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think you're right that sec dispatch needs to probably handle this. So, because I, I could see how we could weigh in, but then I could see the open PGP and lamps people being like, Hey, what about us too? And then you right. have to put this subtle nuance on it. So I think it, it seems to me, it seems to make more sense going to someplace where you're going to get broader input and review basically. True, true. And, you know, DKG and Stephen um, know yeah. about this yeah. draft for sure. They've seen early copies of it. Um, and I think DKG is involved in LAMPS, so that would have covered that. But any, in any case, it'd be, I mean, if nothing else, I'd like the opportunity to tell more people in the security area about this work. Um, and so that is a, that's a good use of that space. So we'll, we'll do that. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, and, you know, thanks for those who've already taken a look and reviewed it. Thanks in advance to those who will do so going forward. Um, we're looking forward to getting another version out, like I said, in a few weeks. So thanks a lot. All right, great. Uh, so now I think we're gonna try to jump into the protocol uh, outstanding issues. Uh, I was hoping Richard would be back, but he's not yet back. So Raphael, I'm hoping we can lead this. I'm um, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, let's see what uh, we should start with. Maybe we can start with the PRs because they're a little more concrete than the issues. Tell me which one you'd like to look at first. So yeah, let's start with uh, the bottom one, the uh, 439. There was quite a bit of discussion around that. Um, <clears throat> so there seems to be some preliminary consensus that doing that is a good idea. Um, so just to recall what the proposal is here, um, the idea is that every uh, leaf in the MLS tree should have its own identity. <clears throat> simply because that makes it a lot easier to tell them apart and you don't have to use the indexes all the time to reference them, uh, which also turns out to be a bit of a problem uh, on the implementation level because you try and abstract away the indexes uh, from the, the actual application using MLS, uh, but then if it's not unique, um, you can't really reference uh, actual members of the group uniquely if you don't have that. So um the practical issue richard had with it was um the case where the identifier would indeed be shared among uh different leaves that all belong to the same user um but i think that problem got resolved um, so i don't think um that there is anyone so far that i've heard of that um would be against making this change um, if not, please speak up now. No, no opinions on it. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, merging it, probably. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a note in here that say that we discussed it. Uh, there was no objection that it should be merged or fixed because I think there's probably some commit problems here. It seems like there's. Yeah, th this one could be merged, but in general, we'll run to that in the next one. So yeah, I think that's a good approach. Thank you, Sean. Comment not close. All right. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, Take the next one then, uh, 4.53. So I don't think we have Eric in the call today. Um, I don't know, Conrad, if you can say something about the uh, security implications of that. Uh, from the discussion, it looks like there is consensus that we want to do it. I'm also not aware of any downsides, but um, yeah, a bit more motivation would actually be helpful. Oof, to be honest, I haven't looked at this PR in quite a while. Uh, as I remember, it's really just moving the place where the context is injected into the key schedule to an earlier secret. 
Um, so, which it's I think it's additional. It's not moving it. It's it uh, doing it one more time. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's I a, seem to remember. It's a dream. Yeah, I, I'd rather push this down the road a bit. I need to take a look at it to to really be able to say something. But I'm pretty sure it's certainly not a like it certainly doesn't decrease security or, or at least it shouldn't. And um, I remember that this made the security proof easier. But again, I can't remember the details. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll prepare something for next time. Okay, maybe we can note that um, we don't see any downsides so far. Now we're looking at uh, 55 in the meantime. Uh, Hugo, I think you are on the call. Hugo, yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I'm here. Conrad, I stuck you with an action item. <laughs> but you need to, re to review the last one, okay? Yeah, that's all right. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Let's see if I can actually do this properly. Ah, Conrad, you can come up. There we go. I have to admit that I haven't looked at this in a really long time. Um, and I yeah, commented on it. So this is the more editorial changes one? 454? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 454. Um, actually, and th there was one uh, part that is not editorial, which was an oversight. And uh, it's a missed, um, which adds yeah, the, the authenticated um, data. Authenticated data. Yeah, I, I sort of snuck that in because it was a tiny change. And I'd, um, I talked to Richard about that, and he said uh, that, yeah, that should have been added. So rather than creating two PRs, I sort of snuck that in. But if I if it should be two different PRs, then I can split it out. Well, I mean, this one we could merge right away. Um, the rest is probably um, something we would have to look at again. So if you want to do a separate PR for just that, I think that would be straightforward. And then uh, you could remove okay. this PR. and. Uh, we only look at the editorial stuff. Yeah, I can do that. Um, okay. So the, the rest of the editorial changes are um, a big chunk of it is because I noticed there was a discrepancy between two different sections. And so I tried to make them both agree with uh, what's implemented in the MLSPP library. And I I think I managed to do that if I've read the MS, MLSPP library correctly. But yeah, I think someone should make sure that I actually did that correctly. Yeah, so what I propose here is that um, <clears throat> we can take that with uh, uh, Richard and look at it. Uh, it's not something where we uh, need consensus from the working group in that sense. Yeah. It's just a matter of resolving the details. Yeah, sounds good. All right, on to the next one. All right, uh, 455. Um, I propose that apparently, yes. So uh, it's just a one line change, essentially. Um, I felt it is ambiguous if you have something that is a list or an array that is also optional because then uh, it could be there but contain zero elements. Um, so that's, I propose to disambiguate it by just removing the, the optional 
uh, part of it. And then it can just be an empty list, essentially. Uh, from the conversation, Benjamin, I think you had some concerns. There. No, it's okay. I mean, we, we discussed it pretty softly. I mean, as long as there is some input, uh, that's fine. So it could, it could be like uh, all zero input in the case where you, you don't like, uh, you have an empty list or something. Um, doesn't impact security. So your proposal works fine. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and merge that if there is no other objections. Nope. Wait, which number was that for my notes? 455. 455. So Richard, I put uh, comments in the previous three that we discussed. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have 462, which I think is editorial. Yes. Yeah, it's already editorial. Um, I don't know, Richard, if you have reviewed that, otherwise I would propose we um, quickly review the uh, wording afterwards and just merge it. Yeah, we can, we can handle this offline. It's just with the editors. Um, okay, then we have a controversial one, uh, 463. Uh, remove the act proposal from Brendan, who's not in the call today. Um, does anyone in the call today want to motivate that PR? The, the argument Brendan makes is that this is not core to the protocol. Um, could be implemented upper layers, et cetera. And so we don't need to have it here. But we already had that discussion at length in previous interims. Um, and I, I think Benjamin had some good arguments for having it at the protocol level. Yeah. Simply also because double ratchet has that mechanism essentially. Yeah. So what are we going to do with that PR? Um, it seems we have no consensus that we want to merge it. So, uh, Sean, what's the uh, course of action here? Well, I think typically we leave it. Okay. I'm just skimming back through the um, through the mailing list thread. Um, it looks like, yeah. I'm not seeing anyone keen on this besides Brendan. So I think um, the chairs want to, it seems like there's ample evidence for the chairs to declare him in the rough and just close this issue. Close this PR. All right, well, let me go back and review that. And uh, that that's the way we end up, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise we'll try to bring it up and. Okay, so the chairs yeah. have the action on this. Yep. yep. Um, so I see 464 now, um, that is also linked to an open issue we have. Uh, so I'm inclined to uh, skip that one for now. That's something Sorry, we that's should discuss four, in more detail. 464? Yes, 464. Yeah, I think this is just a clarification. And is, is, Conrad Sloan, is the intent yeah. here just to clarify the, the situation and not to change processing? It, it, it is, um, but I had a longer discussion with Raphael that came up also while implementing. 
and we created a new issue regarding extensions. So it probably makes sense to just leave this for now and first discuss the greater issue about extensions and then yep. figure out if, if, if this is not like, if we don't need a bigger rewrite. Uh, I see. Do you have an issue number in extensions 473? Oh yeah, sorry. We should have we should have actually linked that on GitHub. Cool. I'll, I'll leave that to you then. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, great. Um, we do 465. Yeah, that looks editorial again. I think it looks, it looks um, approved. Um, yeah, I think this is. Uh, yeah, so again, pretty uncontroversial. Um, I'd be inclined to go ahead and merge it if there is no opposition. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with merging this. All right, I'll add okay. comments. Go ahead and add merging it. Mm -hmm. Looking right, making some progress here. Um, Instant gratification, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> All right, minor fixes to message formats. 466. Um, that was from your return, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so. Oh, this looks like it includes the one line change from my, from my commit or from my PR. So I guess I don't have to right. split that out if we're if we're merging this one. Uh, that's that's a good point. Yes, right there. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, Richard, remind me, this is what we already do in interop, right? So uh, yeah, I think this is that was not motivated by the findings of interop. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah so I think these these have already been integrated in the interop branches of the. Sensations. They're really, um, yeah. so yeah, I think this is just addressing some um, kind of alignment stuff between what's authenticated. If you look at the authenticated data and confirmation taglines, and then adding a missing definition for a parent hash and allowing for big extensions. Nothing, nothing real major here. This. Okay, I, I think all of the uh, people taking part in the implementation effort agree on that one. Um, and since there is not much more to it, I'm going to go ahead and merge it. Done. Anyone against it? No. Okay, it sounds good to me. All right. Um, okay, 467 we discussed earlier. I don't need to do it now. Then fixed typos sounds editorial again, 469. Okay, maybe we can do that offline. Uh, yeah, put that together. Uh, copy and paste the job yeah. that I'm drawing. And then the last one, 471. This is pointing out that we should go to draft 08. Uh, Richard, you're the expert on that, is that correct? Uh, I think so. Let me just check. Um, obviously, we'll ultimately want to change this to the RFC version once we go to final. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, maybe we can just note that Richard's going to check up on that. It's not, nothing I, I think we can merge this. this. Um, yeah, this 08, is 08 is the current version. Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much think that's mostly editorial. It's done. Okay, that concludes the PR part, um, this session at least. So now we should go to the issues, I guess. Yeah. All right, so we got 12 minutes left and I have a hard stop at noon. Yeah. Which one do you want to take first? 
I want to take 473 first because it's a bit of a bigger one. Um, All right. So Connor and I came across some issues when we looked at uh, how extensions currently work. Hmm. And so, well, it's all described in the, in the details there, but the gist of it is that um, it's not entirely clear uh, what a group context extension actually is. So we have extensions that go into the key packages. Those are somewhat well understood in the sense that we have examples of them. They're, uh, even mandatory. Uh, I guess there is uh, there was a mention about that on the mailing list the other day. Uh, but those are not the concern. The concern is the other ones. So it, the spec sort of seems to imply that there are extensions that go into the group context, and the group context has a field for that. Um, but there is no example of such an extension and on how it would behave. Instead, there is some sort of a counterexample, which is a ratchet tree extension. Um, which is similar, but it does not go into the group context, uh, specifically because we don't need it there, it would also be slow. Uh, so the, it's uncontroversial that it doesn't go there, but the question is what actually goes there and how do these uh, extensions manifest? So um, on one hand, I think the, the language should be a little more precise. On the other hand, uh, we made a proposal here um, to actually uh, introduce a, a mechanism to update extensions by having a new proposal type. Um, and that way, uh, members can initially share extensions through a welcome message, which already has a field for that, just like the ratchet tree extension. And then later on, they can also update them and the update mechanism uh, synchronized with epoch changes so that every member knows exactly what to put into the group context, um, which right now is, is, is not clear uh, what, what members should put in there at all. Um, so this gives us clarity and uh, functionality that will actually be useful. Any, any initial comments on, on that idea? Uh, I have some questions. Um, so I see there's this message type group context, right? And then in the extension struct, you've got the message type listed. So that do I understand correctly? An extension could be either a key package extension or a group context extension. Is that right? So this is what the spec currently uh, alludes to, and uh, introducing this uh, this uh, enum here uh, simply makes it clear that. You know, this is what we actually want to achieve. If it's not what we want to achieve, we should probably uh, change the spec. So yeah, the proposal here is to, is to clarify that they are indeed um, really different kinds of extensions. They have a similar format in the sense that they just have a type and a payload, but they're used uh, in different contexts that are completely orthogonal to each other. So I, I, I think I agree that there's a need for clarification here. Um, it seems like basically where you're headed with this is to kind of declare two different logical classes of extensions, um, the key extensions that go in key packages and the extensions that go into the uh, group context. Um, and the extensions in the group context would be set by the creator and then updated, if at all, by this proposal you're talking about. Is that, does that sound like um, an accurate understanding of yes. where you're going here? Yeah, that, that's, um, that's pretty much it, exactly. So the, the key package extensions is, is the one category, um, and uh, essentially it's completely standalone in that sense, uh, because they only live in key packages. And, mm -hmm. and the second category, um, there is a slight nuance between the ones that do go into the group context and the ones that don't, uh, because we have this ratchet tree extension. Um, so either we say this is a complete exception and we treat it as such, and, and maybe that's fine, or we generalize this and say, um, as part of a welcome message, you, you can send a bunch of different extensions, but you must specify which ones of them 
you want to have in the group context. So having them in a group context means the group actually uh, agrees on, on the right. content of the extension. So uh, it sounds like a very powerful mechanism to have. Um, for example, you can synchronize on metadata, um, but there might be other examples where, or other situations where you don't want that for whatever reason, and then you're free to, free to choose uh, which one you want. Yeah, so I, I think there's and, actually- And it nicely covers what we have then. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, I think that kind of where this ends up is actually with three types. We, we have basically have, yeah, three types of extensions. We have the ones that are in the group context, and then we have extensions that are local to a key package and local to a welcome. And I think the, the ambiguity you're pointing out is that in the welcome message, the local to a welcome extension and extensions and the group context extensions are mixed together in one bucket. Um, so I wonder if the way to resolve that is just to have two buckets in the welcome and explicitly say, here are the extensions that go in the group context and here are the other uh, extensions, um, which are, you know, things like things like the the the, well, the ratchet tree extension would go in that you know, local to the welcome extensions bucket. But that's almost what what's being proposed here. The the only yeah. additional thing that's being proposed is that you don't mix the group info ones and the key package ones. That's why we end up with three variants in the end. What do you mean by mix? Well, I mean, um, since they share the same extension uh, struct, um, you know, practically speaking, you cannot really tell them apart. Um, so than by, do you mean you would use their separate ID. name? I mean, so do you mean you would use like separate namespaces or different structs? Well, we don't have to if we introduce this uh, message type enum. That's that's the whole idea here. So we. Uh, the, the current extension uh, struct, uh, oh. which is just below that, oh, sorry, I should have um, is, yeah, is being being extended by this message type. So previously it only had the extension ID and then the extension mm. data, and now it introduces the type. Um, the naming is maybe a bit unfortunate, but that's what in, it is in the spec currently. So just to care. go ahead, Conrad. So yeah, just to be clear, so this uh, essentially allows implementations not to rely on an outside caller or the spec to say what should go into the group context as opposed to what doesn't in a welcome message, but rather kind of it can rely on the message type. But uh, then again, I mean, Richard, if, if we go with the two buckets that you proposed, then that would be explicit as well. So that would at least yeah. partially kind of uh, make that. Yeah, I, I think my inclination here would be to do the two bucket approach in the group info. Um, and then in the IANA registry for extensions, declare which of these three buckets, uh, key package, group context, group info, an extension can appear in. Yeah, I think that can work. Um, then the open question is, the extension update that we propose here um mm -hmm. that one would would uh, be specific to this one bucket essentially yeah that would only touch the group context extensions um and i think what you're missing there mm -hmm. is a list of extension ids to delete uh, well no i'm not sure we agree on that then um, okay <laughs> So, well, what is the so semantic so of this extension, extension update? update? So, yeah, um, in my mind, this extension update can contain updates to extensions that were initially shared in the welcome message, um, but they don't have to go into the group context necessarily. Uh, you could decide to, you know, just use that as a as an end-to-end -end encrypted pipe, essentially, uh, but you you don't seek agreement on on the content necessarily. I don't have an example where wow. you know you would absolutely want this, but um, I just want to keep this sort of flexibility that you don't have to hash it into the group state necessarily. So that seems more like the province of 
proposals and extending along that axis, right? Wait, uh, I, I agree that there is some overlap, yes. But we also have never specified that. So, I mean, maybe we should look at that in, in a broader context. Yeah, I got to run in about a minute. Um, I don't know, Richard, if you, Richard or Nick, if you guys want I, to uh, grab it. I have to drop as well. Um, but I think we need to, need to pick this back up. Uh, we're obviously going to make a request for a meeting session for the ITF online. We may have to have another interim in the, in the middle before that to see if maybe we can move stuff along. I don't know how people feel about that, but it's something we should discuss on list. Um, I hate to I hate to cut this the the discussion short though. Sure. No. I mean, yeah. Uh, the, 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 yeah. The I, I think. Um, yeah, Raphael and Conrad, I can probably find some time to kind of do a little design team on this extension question and propose something back to the list. Okay, that'd be great. All right, thanks everyone. And Richard, I appreciate you taking notes. Sure, I'll send them out in a second. Great, excellent. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Dick Kim. Bye. Bye.